Hello, everyone, and welcome to Lunch Break Science. I'm Ariel Johnson from the Leakey Foundation, a nonprofit that supports human evolution research and shares discoveries. Today, we explore adaptations to extreme environments, redefining women's role in human evolution, and so much more. Stay up to date with the latest discoveries and episodes by subscribing to our channel and clicking the notification bell so you do not miss a thing. Now, let's welcome today's guest, Dr. Kara Ackerbach. Kara, thank you so much for being here with us. Ariel, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who has helped make this production happen. You, you are all magicians, I'm quite certain. <laughs> and thank you to the Leakey Foundation for uh, having me on today. Well, uh, we're just so excited to have you and, and excited to hear about your new research. And, um, and so Kara joins us today from Indiana in the United States, where she is an assistant professor of anthropology and director of the Human Energetics Laboratory at University of Notre, Notre Dame. Her research takes her to some of the most extreme places that humans live, like subarctic Finland, where we're zooming in now, to look at how we adapt and thrive in these environments. Here is a um, coming up is an amazing photo of uh, Kara. Me? <laughs> yeah, catching the tiniest fish possible <laughs> during that excursion, but it was the only catch of the day, so I still well, have that pride. That's what counts. <laughs> <laughs> so before we dig deeper, thank you to the Ann and Gordon Getty Foundation, Camilla and George Smith, the Joan and Arnold Travis Education Fund, and to viewers like you. Your support through YouTube giving at the bottom corner of this video and through our website makes new episodes of Lunch Break Science possible. Again, just thank you so much. If you're watching live, drop a comment or question for Kara in the chat. If you are catching the replay, let us know what you want to learn more about. Uh, so my first question for you is, what does better understanding our current adaptations tell us about our evolutionary past? Yeah, it's one of these things that this is actually something I was talking about to my students, you know, a mere four hours ago at this point <laughs> of, you know, how in the world do you take this thing, a fossil, whether it be a stone tool or the remains of a, of a creature at some point, that is no longer organic, has been replaced by stone, and then try to recreate what they may have looked like and how they may have acted. And that's a really difficult thing to do. Um, although this is a picture of me here in Finland, I'll just give an overlay really quickly, collecting a resting metabolic rate among one of the reindeer herders there. Uh, this is me showing off a uh, the cooling suit uh, that I use to cold stress the, the reindeer herders to see what their responses are like. And then this was uh, the first part of our lab set up in, um, in Inari, Finland, where we used an, an old school to do these various measurements. And then this is me in Texas, Fort Worth, Texas, in a climate chamber, where we are trying to understand the ways in which uh, folks of different body shapes and sizes respond uh, physiologically to extremes of hot, dry, hot, humid, cold, dry, and then of course, comparing it to room temperature. Um, and it's really important, uh, as I was saying before the pictures came up, that for us to understand the way things were in the past, we need to have a good understanding of the way things are now, because we cannot go into the past and actually measure you know, hominins uh, when they were evolving along the way uh, to see how they responded to extreme heat or what the transition was like once they actually entered cold climates, for example. And so we need to have a really strong grasp on modern day anatomy and physiology to try to reconstruct the lives and behaviors of our past ancestors. So you recently published two very compelling articles, including Woman the Hunter, which shares the title with the episode, and you'll discuss these shortly. Yeah. Our backgrounds are just incredibly important to shaping how we ask questions and approach research. So we have a question for all of you, our viewers. Um, these two questions will be asked and we wanna see what you think. So please write the responses to these questions in the chat pretty much right now. So our first question is, uh, what words come to mind when you hear testosterone? And the second question is, what words come to mind when you hear estrogen? So please put those questions in, or the answers, your answers to those questions in the chat now, and we will um, get back to those responses before we hear Kara's talk. So um, 
what experiences inspired you to explore this topic? Yeah, there, it's kind of two-pronged approach on this one. Uh, one comes from my own personal background. And um, so I'm a former power lifter. As I was just telling the Leaky crew, I have a I have a broken back and uh, I've had it for about eight years now and it was only diagnosed about a year and a half, almost two years ago. Um, it's never fun going to doctor after doctor and having your pain ignored, but that was the case. Um, but in the heyday of my powerlifting, I went to like a real hardcore powerlifting gym and I was almost always the only woman in that space and surrounded by a bunch of a bunch of guys who could be very clearly called dude bros and gym bros that kind of that toxic masculinity, everything is about strength and the, the persona around strength and toughness. And it was a really, really difficult space for me for a very long time. And, you know, there would often be comments thrown around about women being weaker and there's no way that men or women can do the kinds of things that men can do. And it's something that for whatever reason, I hadn't really thought about on a personal level so much until I was thrown into this environment. And, you know, I had to find different behavioral adaptive ways to deal with it. And full disclosure, part of it was taking on some of those toxic masculine traits, unfortunately, um, and it got me through. But it was also formative and in, in getting me to think about what are some of the physiological and anatomical differences between females and males that are going to contribute in some way to athletic performance. And then what kind of athletic performance, you know, endurance based things versus power based things. So I started thinking about it on a personal level that extended a little bit to, you know, an exercise physiology and academic level. But I didn't really start thinking about the connection to human evolution until a little bit later um, when I got to the University of Notre Dame and I was teaching my um, Fundamentals of Biological Anthropology course. And once we get into the fossil hominins, um, I have my students do what has become one of my favorite assignments because it's hilarious, is I have them create online dating profiles for the fossil hominin of their choice. And so they have to fill out what like a, a fake Tinder, they don't actually sign up, like a fake Tinder profile or any platform of their choosing that has to be grounded in what we know about the fossil hominin behavior, diet, locomotion, tools, where they were geographically, all of that. And the first few semesters I did this, it was almost universal that no matter the gender of the student, they were writing their online dating profile of the fossil hominin from the point of view of a man. They always defaulted to that fossil hominin being a man. And it kind of started with like, me chiding them like, oh, you guys, look, what are you doing? You, all these, why are these all men? What's happening here? And then I stopped to think about why, why in the world would they be defaulting to the male perspective in this situation? And I kind of sat and sat and sat with it for a little bit and, you know, realized that's how a lot of the textbooks are written. That's how a lot of the films and comic books and cartoons and everything that they've been exposed to the entire story of human evolution has been largely written by and from the perspective of men. And so the male role within human evolution has always been a, a, the, the most prominent. And that seeps in at an almost unconscious level. And so that's when I kind of started putting these two things together and thinking about, right, here's this perspective that's always been male. And unfortunately, in my graduate education, we didn't get into the amazing feminist anthropology literature and feminist human evolution, evolution literature that's been brought on by, you know, the the towering and impressive figures of Sarah Hardy and, and Adrian Zillman and Sally Slocum, all of those. Um, I didn't get that exposure. And I wanted to start thinking about ways that we could update that because so much of it has been based on archaeology and based on ethnography. And there's been some really wonderful work done on that, but not so much from the physiological aspect of things uh, since so much of what we do the story about human evolution has revolved around this importance of man, the hunter, quote unquote. Um, and I wanted to flip that on that head and, and take a look at what, what physiological aspects of women in particular might be particularly suited for activities like hunting. Oh, can't hear you. <laughs> Okay, there we go. <laughs> let's take a look at some of our responses. We have a, a word cloud. Um, let's take a look at the 
yeah, we <laughs> magically. <laughs> um, let's take a look at testosterone first. It's a little bit small. Trick question. I like whoever wrote that. <laughs> All right. Steroid massacre is a male drive and male. All right. Okay. And then we have estrogen. Cancer. And also trick question. Oh my goodness. That's, that's a really limited view on poor estrogen there. <laughs> yeah. So what do you think? Um, so, I mean, it's, it's actually... The testosterone was a little bit closer when I do this exercise with my students, um, and this is for when I teach anthropology of sports, of we have a lot of these stereotypes around these hormones of testosterone and estrogen, and they are this complete binary of like testosterone man and estrogen woman or male, female, and like never the two shall meet. Um, and it seems like this this crowd gets a little bit better. Uh, so I, I, I'm not surprised though, the cancer one surprised yeah. me just a little bit, but I totally get it since there are, you know, breast cancers that love estrogen and people have to go on estrogen blockers. So yeah, I'm not horribly surprised um, or majorly surprised, but yeah, it's pretty typical. So um, we will hear more about yeah. your research on environmental adaptation and your outreach contributions after your talk. Yeah. Uh, but uh, if you are watching this and enjoying the episode, uh, let us know by giving us a thumbs up and dropping a comment in the chat. We love to know what you think. Now, let's turn over the virtual floor uh, to Kara and hear about her research. All right. Uh, so you've already gotten a little bit of a preview uh, about this, given uh, what I was talking about of kind of my own personal journey to be talking about these things. And so I want to first say, first and foremost, so two papers came out that were titled Woman the Hunter, and there was the physiological evidence and there was the archaeological evidence. And I want to give a massive shout out uh, to my longtime friend and colleague, Dr. Sarah Lacey, who was the lead author on the archaeological evidence one. Um, it's been a beautiful collaboration and it's so much fun to work with friends and, and talk through these issues together. So that's the big shout out I want to give right up front. All right, so let's actually dig in. And Adrienne Zillman was one I mentioned early on. Uh, and she has this wonderful quote that popular pictures drawn of the past are too often little more than backward projections of cultural sex stereotypes onto humans who lived more than a million years ago. And that idea is, is that we look around the world today and we see the social structures that exist where males typically have the majority of the power. I should say men typically have the majority of the power and women do not. And researchers in the past, uh, around the time of Man the Hunter, which I'll talk about in a moment, would take that kind of social structure and basically extend it into the past and assume that's exactly what the social structure would have been like in the past. And that led to things like these, what you see in the little image to the left here of the caveman pulling the, the woman by the hair. I have no idea what that weird dinosaur critter is next to them. Please don't ask. Um, but it's these big dominant males and they did the hunting and they did all the things that make humans human. And, but what we also saw at this time, so man, the hunter, the, um, there was a conference back in 1966 where they brought in all of these people to talk about human evolution and uh, modern day hunter gatherers to look at how they hunted and everything that they did. And the big, big push or crux of, of that conference and then the subsequent edited volume that came out a couple of years later was that hunting is what drove human evolution, that we have hunting to thank for our unique suite of uh, human characteristics, our, our physical abilities, as well as our intellectual abilities, and that it was men doing the hunting to the exclusion of women. And so when you kind of extend that out, evolution was therefore only acting upon men and women were these kind of passive beneficiaries that were really only there for popping out babies and rearing those children. Uh, and so at that time, the, the, the picture there to your right, this was the kind of sexism that we saw on a daily basis. So the woman there with the numbers 261 on her um, on her sweatshirt, that is Catherine Schweitzer. She was the first woman to run the Boston Marathon. Um, and she actually entered it as KV Schweitzer um, to hide her gender at the time. Granted, there were no actual official rules. Um, to keep women off the course of the Boston Marathon, it just was not done. Um, and 
people were really, really, really upset. And so what you see in this picture, I know it's a little bit tough to see, but directly behind uh, Catherine Schweitzer, above her right shoulder, above that too, you see a man's face. That's Jock Semple. That is the race manager. He is literally trying to physically pull her off of the Boston Marathon race course. And the other guys behind her are part of her running crew and are trying to stop Jock Semple from pulling her off. And so that is the sort of sexist, <laughs> ideas of what was going on back in the 1960s that one, this is no place for women. This is the male sphere, but also that doing this kind of rigorous physical exercise would be damaging to women, not only a stressful burden on them mentally, but also a physical stress that might impact their reproductive capacities. Um, and just as a note, Catherine Schweitzer recently re-ran the Boston Marathon uh, on the anniversary of, uh, of her 1966 run. I believe she did it in 2016, uh, I believe. And so that was a big thing. And so we've come a long way, not only in our inclusion of women in sports that had largely been blocked off to women, but also within anthropology as well. And so I have a lot of the feminist, foundational feminist works that have come out in, in the interim since Man the Hunter that have done a wonderful job critiquing that hypothesis. Um, and like I said before, a lot of the critiques have come from a little bit more ethnographic, archeological and some behavioral aspects uh, about the female of the species. And the take that I have onto this is more looking at the anatomy and the physiology to see what we can learn from that. And so before I dive into that, I just want a brief note about sex, gender, and research. Um, gender exists on a spectrum. Uh, sex also exists on a spectrum. Uh, no matter how you try to quote unquote define biological sex, you don't necessarily have these extreme binaries that people bring about, whether it's based on chromosomes or hormones or um, genitalia or secondary sexual characteristics, you get this spectrum. Uh, and as part of the representation here, uh, that exercise physiology research, which is what I draw a lot of this from, typically uses the terms female and male. They don't necessarily define them in the work, but they do use this binary uh, that is often referring to, but again, not actually defined as sex assigned at birth. And so I will be using female and male here, particularly when talking about the biological aspects. And hopefully I will not use man and woman in that term. Sometimes I fall back into it, unless I'm talking about more social roles. Uh, and so the other part of this, that this research is biased. Um, from 2011 to 2013, females made up only 39% of participants in exercise medicine studies. And in 2015, so a bit more recent, that did improve to 42%, but it actually really depended on what area of exercise or the sports science research you were looking at. Um, and so looking at disease related to sports exercise, uh, women made up, women only studies made up 29%. That's actually pretty good. But if you look at athletic performance, only 3% of studies were among females only, whereas 63% of studies were among males only. And even though that there are now mandates from NSF and NIH that you need to have equal numbers, researchers are getting away with not complying with that without any real repercussions to their research program. And so the things that we know about exercise physiology about females is really scrappy and sparse. And for the most part, females are being treated as small males, that their, their bodies would behave the exact same way a small male would. And that's pretty much patently false in many ways. So keep in mind as I go through the rest of this data uh, and, and all of these things I'm going to tell you, I could be proven wrong in the next 15 years if we actually reach parity in research between females and males in exercise science. Uh, so, and the other the caveat I want to make is that there are very real and uncontroversial sex differences between females and males. But the ones that often give females an advantage, especially physically, are ignored. And so I'm going to focus on those ignored ones today. And again, more of this work could help us reshape our reconstruction of the past. Because again, we have to know about the present to be able to reconstruct the past, at least accurately. All right, so some of the anatomical evidence that has been ignored. So females tend to have very broad pelvises, or which we call mediolaterally, you could think of left to right, whereas males tend to have more narrow pelvises. So the pelvises you see here, the one on the left is a male and the one on the right is a female. And it has been this long-standing idea that this wide pelvis might be energetically inefficient for females, that it would actually cost more calories 
per step, per mile, in any way you want to think about it, for females to walk versus males walking. And it turns out from what we can tell so far with the data, that is not true. Um, so there's some work is not demonstrated here um, in this graph, but uh, in some work done by Dr. Anna Warner, uh, who was a grad student when I was a grad student at Wash U, she showed no cost differences between males and females. Um, the one caveat there is that there wasn't a huge range of variation in pelvic breadth for us to really understand if there's a difference. However, work by Kara Walshefler and, and um, Marsha Myers actually started looking at uh, the way females move and the way males move, especially when carrying a burden, a load. Uh, and so they, there, there were two studies done from this lab, one where they carried a fake child, uh, a mannequin child around to see how much it would cost, and then another study done where they people were carrying their own actual living children. And what they found was is that females were actually more energetically efficient at carrying burdens than males were. Uh, and this held true on an even track when they were carrying the fake child. And this was also true when they were on uneven terrain, a hiking trail, while carrying their own child, uh, yeah, their own children. Uh, females were much, much more efficient. And so when, you, when we think about it biomechanically, there, there is this idea that having a wider pelvis to some extent should make you cost more because you get a lot more pelvic rotation when you have wider pelvis when you walk on two feet. Uh, but it turns out that females actually utilize that pelvic rotation to extend kind of in, in some ways their leg length. By shifting their pelvis forward, they can make their effective leg length longer. Um, and that actually helps reduce the cost. So you don't necessarily see this additional cost that one might expect with those wider pelvis. Another anatomical thing that's quite interesting, and this is something that might give females an endurance advantage. So think of long distance running, walking, biking, swimming, those kinds of things. Um, females have more type one muscle fibers. So the type one muscle fibers are the long, slow burn endurance fibers. Um, they don't contract very quickly. They don't produce a whole lot of power, but they can keep going and going and going. They do not fatigue fast. They are the endurance muscle fibers. Whereas males tend to have more type two muscle fibers, which are your quick short bursts of energy. They can be very powerful, but that power is short lived. So females have far more. Um, and so that gives them a bit of the endurance advantage, whereas males have more of the type two, which could give them a sprinting or power lifting advantage, if you will. And so now the physiological evidence, because I know I don't want to go too long and into the talk. Uh, and so estrogen. Uh, there are very sparse words provided for estrogen. So these are some of the things that you might know about the effects of estrogen. Um, some of them you also might not know that it actually, estrogen helps protect against the bad cholesterols. So your LDL and um, your VLDL cholesterols and your triglycerides. Um, and it helps increase the good one, which is HDL. It can increase bone strength and bone density, Density, sorry, has anti-aging effects. Uh, it helps control body temperature and memory function. But we also, the things that you're likely more aware of are the things related to the reproductive system. So breast growth, uh, maturation of eggs and the ovaries, and then being a part of the whole menstrual cycle. Those are things that you're likely more familiar with. However, there are likely a lot of things that you don't know about estrogen. Uh, so this, please don't feel, you can do a screen cap if you want, or you can take a look at the American Anthropologist paper. I'm more than happy to send it to you since it is behind a paywall, so just email me. These are all of the other things that estrogen does in the body, and it is a ton of stuff. It is far more. And with the exception of the reproductive functions relating to breast tissue and the uterus and ovaries, these happen in both females and males. So one of the big reasons why we think this is true is that the estrogen receptor, so the protein that the estrogen hormone actually locks onto to then set off the cascade of, of the different physiological processes, it's really old. It's 1.2 billion to 600 million years old. And it turns out the testosterone receptor is about half that age. And so this also predates sexual reproduction, which means estrogen had massive impacts on just basic physiological functions before sexual reproduction ever came about. And so estrogen has these vast pervasive effects throughout the body. Um, and I think it's really incredibly important to, for people to understand that. Uh, 
but it also has a huge number of effects on physical activity and performance. And most people would never, ever, ever think this to be true, uh, but it's actually becoming a little bit more common for, for folks to be using estrogen as a sort of performance enhancing drug. Uh, so this is the, the quick list of things, and I'll go through some of the specifics after this slide of how estrogen can improve exercise performance or athletic performance. So it can improve muscle recovery and repair. It can improve growth hormone production and growth hormone itself is something that people will take to improve their performance. It increases the number of androgen receptors and the synonym for androgen receptors is testosterone receptors. So estrogen can actually improve the way testosterone functions in the body. It can also improve fatty acid oxidation, uh, and it, which means you use more fats and using more fats is good because that's the long low burn substrate for, for metabolic fuel uh, that helps to delay fatigue as well. It's also going to increase um, the way that the body stores glucose or carbohydrates within the body uh, and improve insulin sensitivity. So uh, the impact of estrogen is why females tend to suffer less from diabetes than males do. Uh, and if they do suffer from it, it's usually later in life when um, menopause has come into play and estrogen levels have dropped. And it can also improve serotonin levels. So give you the positive, happy sorts of feelings when you train harder. So it's got lots and lots and lots of positive effects. So let's take a look at some of the other things that are not necessarily related to estrogen, although they're also still likely related to estrogen. Um, so again, estrogen is not just for reproduction, uh, but another hormone that's really, really important in this is adiponectin. So this is the hormone that's going to modulate how both glucose and fats are used in the body as a metabolic fuel. And it increases fat utilization, which again is way better for endurance sports than it is necessarily for your quick anaerobic power sports. Sports. And females have as much as 65% more adiponectin than males, which is what this graph here is showing. Females are in the little squares and males are in the little circles, is that females have way more adiponectin even after training. This was doing um, 12 months to 24 months worth of exercise training. And yeah, you saw males go up at around month 20 or uh, month 12 and then dip down again around month 24. But females maintained higher levels of adiponectin and therefore were burning fats far more than males were. And so this reduced muscle damage, I said that improves potentially the reduced muscle damage as well as improving recovery. So when you exercise and you're stressing your body or when you're undergoing massive heat stress outside, which I know parts of the United States really experienced it this past summer. I was in Fort Worth, Texas for most of the summer and it was 108 degrees every day. So I know this feeling. Uh, when your body is undergoing this kind of acute stress, these things called heat shock proteins are rele uh, released into the body and they can cause damage to cells. Um, and it turns out that females can have kind of an attenuated or lower heat shock protein response than males do. Males experience a higher heat shock protein response. And this might be related to estrogen as well. Uh, uh, estrogen seems to have this sort of stabilizing effect on cell membranes to help keep them intact under stress, uh, whereas males don't have that response. And so females incur less cellular damage than males do in response to the same intensity level of exercise. So that's really important to keep in mind when you put them through the same sorts of batteries of tests, females are experiencing less damage and therefore able to recover faster than males are. And then there's this interesting thing about psychological pacing, and I know some new work is going to be coming out about this soon, so I'm really excited to see that. Um, the idea is, is uh, there's this broad study done by uh, Robert Diener and colleagues, and he's at Grand Valley State University in uh, Grand Rapids, sorry, Allendale, Michigan, um, and they looked at pace times uh, for different running endurance events between females and males. And what they found was is that females were able to maintain a more steady pace throughout the race. Love the rhyming words. Uh, whereas males kind of progressively slowed down over time. And so I know you see this, like the blue line, which is males is higher. You might think, oh, that's a faster pace. No, that's the difference between their starting pace and their ending pace. And so males have a higher difference, meaning they're slowing more, whereas females have a lower difference, means they're slowing less. We don't know if this is necessarily due to a psychological pacing, that females are better able to judge how much distance is left to run and therefore able to maintain the pace better, or if this could be related to that estrogen effect delaying fatigue over time. My guess is there might be, you know, both going on, but it's going to take a lot of work to kind of tease those two apart and a whole lot more data. 
And so this is kind of the, the a big and interesting review of all of these things basically set females up to be physiologically better suited for long endurance events. And it's actually been modeled. And sadly, the last modeling of this was back in 1997. So this is ripe for re-upping and research uh, by BAM et al. And they estimated and it hasn't really fully been tested yet, that at roughly 65 kilometers, anything at 65 kilometers and above in distance, females will outperform males consistently. Whereas anything in those shorter ranges, males may or may not have the advantage. Definitely in the much shorter, but when you start getting into the 50 to 60 kilometer range, Still not quite as sure because those are not very common distances <laughs> for people to run in races. Um, so yeah, and so it's that estrogen effect of allowing greater fatty acid oxidation, the higher adiponectin levels, the reduced muscle damage, and that better psychological pacing kind of set up this physiological context that give females the benefit and the advantage in endurance activities. And so this is that summary slide of all the things that I just said and the ways in which females actually might have the, the endurance benefit over males. And again, I will leave that there for a moment and take a sip of my coffee if you want to screenshot it or shot it, you know, snap it with your phone. I can also, again, gladly send papers to anyone who contacts me. Okay. And then moving on. So why? Why in the world might females have this endurance advantage and potentially males have this power advantage? What, what could be setting this up? And so this is a hypothesis that I, I've been kind of toying with in my head a little bit. And I know Kara Walshuffler has been thinking about it. And there's a, a grad student over at, at Duke who's looking at pregnancy and endurance as well, Shruti Shadir, um, and to, to try to understand that maybe pregnancy has a really, really big role to play in shaping the endurance capacities of females. So you have this picture, which is from um, the, the the Earth's Children series, The Clan of the Cave Bear, which is a horrible movie. <laughs> I gotta say it, it's not good. Uh, but I actually really like the books. Um, and you, you see uh, the, the main character, Ayla here, carrying a child while also having a bunch of stuff on her back. And then all the other members of her group are carrying like heavy, heavy burdens on their back too, and they're walking all over the place. And so you have what is set up as a quote unquote dual burden. And I don't want to say children are burdens, quote unquote, because they're a burden on life. But at least metabolically speaking, they kind of are. They take a lot of calories from a female, whether through lactation or caring or all of that sorts of stuff. Um, it's very metabolically expensive. And in our evolutionary past, Life could not shut down just for a mother to take care of the child. They still had to move. They still had to acquire resources. They still had to evade predators, all of these things. Um, and we see that in the wild still today. Um, a pregnant lioness does not just stop hunting. A, a new mother lioness might stop hunting for a very, very short period of time right before, during, and right after labor and delivery, but she's got to go right back out there to get calories so she can breastfeed her offspring. So there's absolutely no reason why we should think that females were physically incapable of doing these arduous tasks like persistence hunting or carrying heavy burdens just because they had to deal with pregnancy, labor delivery, and lactation. We would not have survived if females had to shut everything down in their lives if they stopped during those parts of their reproductive life cycle. And I think one of the really awesome kind of modern day correlates to this is Sophie Power, uh, who is the picture there on the right. She ran the uh, Ultra Trail de Mont Blanc race, which is a 106 mile grueling, grueling race three months after giving birth to her son. And that is her son you see there. And during this 106 mile race, she would stop at the break points and breastfeed while also doing the, 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 the milk machine, whatever it's called, I don't have the words for that, um, on her breaks while resting. And you can see literally passed out next to her is a male sleeping while she is pumping out breast milk three months after giving birth, and she completed that race. And I think that is a wonderful, wonderful demonstration of the way that females are set up to have these heavy metabolic demands on their bodies and still perform at very high levels. Breast pump. Thank you, Aileen. <laughs> Can you tell I have never had children? Um, and so we are also now getting more archaeological evidence that shows that 
females were hunting. There was the paper that came out about the Andean population showing a, a female burial with weapons associated with hunting and that there were a number of, of female sites with those weapons buried with them. I mean, like I said earlier in this talk, the default has always been males do it. Uh, and so it's really, really difficult um, to kind of get rid of that stereotype when our null hypothesis is that males were doing the hunting. In order to break that hypothesis down, we then need you know, exact evidence that it was females doing hunting as well. And so I'm hoping this talk and all of the work we have coming out of this is gonna help researchers and those up and coming to come at these sorts of archeological sites as well as physiological ones with a null hypothesis, hypothesis of there was no sexual division of labor. It wasn't just males doing this and females doing that until we have explicit evidence that that's what they were doing. And all of this is to say is that in order to better understand our past and to be able to provide the proper context for those archeological finds that we have, we need to better understand our present. And we are currently ignoring half of our present by the very, very poor representation we have of females, both as exercise physiology researchers, but also as participants in, in exercise physiology studies. This is something that it is ripe, ripe, ripe for research and for funding. And I hope this inspires more people to do it because it's going to take a huge amount of people to, to really start uncovering what those differences are and the ways in which females might have an endurance advantage if they truly do have an endurance advantage. And so with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention and what I see comments all over the place. Uh, and we can move on from there. Thank you all so much. And again, thank you to the Leakey Foundation. Well, thank you so much. Um, that was just incredibly compelling work. Uh, for our viewers, if you enjoyed Kara's talk, let us know by giving us a thumbs up. Uh, if you had unlimited resources, what would the next step in this research project be? I would literally make this gigantic research center that focused on nothing but female athletic performance. Um, and I would also include women's athletic performance because I, I think we, as we move into transgender athlete inclusion and, 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 and sadly in some places, places exclusion, we don't have the data to support that kind of policy one way or the other. And until we actually start testing it and looking at it much more thoroughly, I would love to have this massive research center and bring together all the greatest minds in exercise physiology and also start supporting and lifting up other women in exercise physiology to do this research because we have a long way to go to catch up. In several of your projects, you look at adaptation to extreme environments. Yeah. Where did you go and what did you learn? Yeah, so a few different things. So I've been in the Rocky Mountains. Of, oh, we'll talk about Finland. Uh, so this is in Finland. Um, so this is during the, uh, the autumn reindeer herd roundup in the fall where the Finnish reindeer herders kind of collect every all the reindeer and separate them to those to be slaughtered and those to be kept. This is in the Rocky Mountains where people hiked and lived at altitude uh, for several months at a time. This is me again, ice fishing and catching the world's tiniest fish ever uh, on the, I believe it was the Yutsioki River can't quite remember. I could be wrong about that. It's been a while since I've had that picture taken. Um, and so, yeah, it's taken me all over, which is, you know, part of the fun of it. And I got to tell you, I've got the, the Finland itch at this point. I'm, I'm itching to go back. I haven't been since this past winter and uh, autumn in Finland is actually really beautiful and mushroom hunting season, which is always fun. Ooh, mushrooms are like my I favorite. Know. That sounds amazing. The reindeer love them too. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we would like to congratulate you for being awarded the 2023 AABA and Leakey Foundation Communication and Outreach Award in honor of Camilla Smith for your outstanding uh, public communication and educational outreach efforts in biological anthropology. So again, just like congratulations. Thank you. And thank you so much and to the Leak Foundation and the Camilla. I'm never going to get all of it right, but uh, the Camilla B. Smith, something like Cam that? Camilla Smith. Camilla yeah, Smith, Camilla yeah, Smith, yeah. and you know all of that for for supporting outreach and um, science communication because it's something that doesn't get rewarded enough, especially within the institutional level at different universities. So thank you for supporting and promoting it. Well, it's our pleasure. Tell us about some of your projects and why sharing your work with the public is so important. Yeah, and I mean, you know, this is part of it. I'm always happy to, to give talks or respond to media requests and things like that and do podcasts. And I mean, I think the biggest part of it is, you know, 
sort of an accountability in some way. I mean, many of us in the field are supported by the National Science Foundation, which gets its money from your tax dollars. And you have every right to know where those tax dollars are going. Like, what in the world is research among reindeer herders? How does that affect me in my day-to-day -day life? You have every right to know how I'm spending your tax dollars and what this research, how it can help you. Um, maybe not in the immediate future, but hopefully down the line that it can. So there's one, there's that accountability part that we need to make sure that we are letting people know how that money is being spent and hopefully being spent responsibly to, to better the world around us. Uh, and the other part of it is, I, I think it is... There's always seems to be this big divide between the scientists and their quote unquote ivory towers and then the general public. And those barriers need to be broken down. Um, so much of our work gets translated by people maybe with not necessarily the, the best scientific background. And so perhaps it's not being well represented. And so things get misrepresented, whether through podcasts or the media or whatever. And it becomes much harder to correct misinformation than if you came out and gave the proper information to begin with. And the best way to do that is to be your own voice and actually talk about your work on your terms uh, so that it doesn't get misrepresented. And so that is the second reason why I think it's absolutely important. And then the third one is... I think it's inspirational to hear other scientists talk and not only about the really cool stuff that they do all the time, but also the human side of it and the struggles that we all face and go through. I mean, you know, all the famous researchers, you all often only hear about the big fancy good stuff, but do you know how many failures have went behind that one success? It is a lot. We all have a mountain of rejections to the small hill of acceptances when it comes to papers and grants and awards and all of these things. And so I think it's also really important to understand the struggle and to be honest about that struggle, especially for people aspiring scientists. Like they all think it's just this easy thing of like, bam, you know, all of a sudden you got an NSF grant. No, it's a lot of work and it's okay to fail because we learn from those failures. Uh, and as for other projects that I do, so I co-host a podcast with my wonderful friend and colleague, oh, there it is, uh, Dr. Christopher Lynn, who's a professor over at the University of Alabama. And it is the podcast for the American Journal of Human Biology and the Human Biology Association. We, we run on a weekly schedule during the academic year. We take summers off because we're often in the field doing our own data collection. Uh, and uh, the other thing that I would like to promote is my children's lab manual, uh, Ruby. So Ruby is my niece. She is turning nine this October. Um, and it would be fall of 2020. I was asking her what she wanted for her birthday. And she's like, I want science experiments. I had gotten her one of these like, you know, cheapo science experiment kits online that anyone could get. And we went through it and it was a lot of fun for her. I was a bit disappointed in the science. It's a thing, it's a, it's a, you know, wasn't the best. Uh, and so when she asked for that for her birthday, I started looking at more pre-made kits and I, I, I found that it had kind of lacked on some of the scientific knowledge, even at, you know, a very rudimentary level for, you know, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds. And so I decided to curate my own lab manual for my niece and uh, found a bunch of cool projects online and put together the experiments and then put together a section on what, what's happening, what the science behind it is, and then featured a woman scientist, sorry, a woman scientist who does that that kind of science in her life. Um, and I made either the mistake or the good idea, depending on how you look at it, of just literally posting that front page picture that was just up on the screen on Twitter and saying, oh, hey, I made this thing for my niece. There we go. I literally, that's all I posted. And I woke up to like 1,200 Twitter direct messages asking for copies of it. And I have never been so overwhelmed in my entire life of responding to, I lost two weeks of my life responding to Twitter direct messages. And I give full credit to the University of Notre Dame for providing a lot of resources to help me out uh, to make a, a much smaller, at least byte-wise, megabyte-wise version of the lab manual so I could put it up on my website to be freely downloadable. We got funds to translate it all into Spanish so that it would be more broadly applicable to more people. And we even got funding to provide full kits of all the ingredients needed for these experiments for a local school, as well as slightly smaller kits that we shipped out to a, a school in California. And so that was one that I absolutely loved doing. And it was nothing I ever planned because it was literally meant to be a birthday gift for my niece and it exploded into this big thing that I hope has more impact. And perhaps looking back on it, I should have really known parents would have wanted that because we were still in the depths of 
COVID lockdowns and they were stuck at home with kids not knowing what to do with them. Uh, and so having this ready-made lab kit that for the most part used a lot of household items is a great way to, for, to interact with kids on the on, about science and also to show them a lot of different women scientists and the kind of work they do. Well, we have shared those links in the chat, so be sure to check out both resources. I am looking forward to doing some of uh, the experiments in Ruby's lab manual with my nephew. Um, so now let us take some questions from our viewers. If you are watching and haven't submitted your question, get those questions in the chat right now. Mm -hmm. um, let me see here. Where is our, our first question comes from, um, I think, Sharon? Mm -hmm. Is this the one about what are the implications? That one, yes. yeah. Uh, what are the implications for this athletic performance uh, among postmenopausal females or those on hormone blockers? That is an amazing question. And you will probably be unsurprised to, to hear that I don't know. And because this is not exactly a population subset that gets studied for these kinds of things. Uh, however, I would, this is me totally spitballing, totally spitballing, that with that drop in estrogen, um, you would likely see they're not the individuals are likely not burning as much fat. Their insulin sensitivity is probably getting worse over time. They might get experience more muscle damage during exercise, um, and they might have a harder time recovering. Those are all things that could be happening. Um, we are getting much better in the realm of hormone replacement therapies to treat menopause, that you don't have to go through those symptoms of getting the what happens when you have lower estrogen in your body. Uh, and, and doctors are now able to much more finely tune that to reduce the risks and boost the positives of it. But that is another area ripe for research. Also, just understanding the the athletic or performance implications during the menstrual cycle, because there is ups and downs of, of the different hormones during the menstrual cycle. And the, the results from what we've seen for performance during the menstrual cycle are all over the place. We don't really have a consensus. And a big part of that is it's, it's difficult to control for all the different types of hormonal birth control that individuals might be on. Um, and so we need to have really, really, really big sample sizes across the reproductive life of, uh, of women to fully understand how things like the menstrual cycle and menopause could be affecting not only athletic performance, but also metabolic health. So uh, the next question comes from Cheryl. The man, the hunter, is such a pop cultural phenom. What's a snappy way to correct someone when they make that kind of assertion? Ask them for the evidence. Seriously. Like, all right, you're telling me this. So tell me why. Uh, exactly what evidence do you have and make them back that up. Actually, that is my advice for anybody who throws out some sort of, you know, science myth or, you know, misconception that you have. It's just very, when you ask them to actually provide the evidence, they're going to struggle to really provide it. And hopefully, you know, talks like mine and Dr. Sarah Lacey's or our papers are going to help arm you with the actual evidence to say like, yeah, no, it wasn't just guys doing this. Women were doing this uh, but I would, you know, put their feet to the fire, make them, make them tell you exactly what it is that led them to believe this other than media. Uh, our next question comes from a uh, Dax. Is there any research being done on how trans women, uh, men and non-binary people perform physically and how hormones affect this? Yeah, there is. And it's becoming more common now. I mean, obviously, it, it, this has not been an issue for quite some time because a lot of trans individuals feared coming out as trans to even participate in sports and do these things. Um, the research is still sparse. I'm not going to lie to you. And it's going to be sparse for quite some time. And part of it's just a pure numbers game. Something like 0.6% of the U.S. population. So zero dot six percent of the U.S. population is um, thought to be a transgender individual. So then you have how many are actually transitioning and then how many among those transitioning are athletes and then what are the different sports represented across those, you know, individuals. So we're talking about really small sample sizes and you have to be able to track their performance before a transition, during a transition and after a transition. So we are talking about long term studies with very expensive and you know, kind of demanding protocols of collecting hormones as well, like hormone blood samples to see where the hormones are at, as well as looking at the performance metrics. Um, so 
it's going to be a long time. The work is happening and we do have some data now, but like the samples are quite small. Um, there's one study on like eight individuals and the results are kind of all over the place. Um, some went down, some stayed the same, some went up in their performance. And so it's going to be a while, Dax, and I'm sorry I can't give you a more solid answer, but I'm hoping more work is on the way. Our next question comes from Catherine. Uh, I know that uh, women are credited for founding a farming. Have you found any additional evidence for women being hunters as well in ancient times? Yeah, so there's that picture that I showed in, in my talk of, uh, the, that's the, the Peruvian um, woman you saw with a spear throwing, looked like she was hunting a llama. Yeah, that one. That's totally some sort of llama. Um, so this is archaeology, uh, archaeological evidence that we actually have where females that they confirmed from, again, we're, we're going on a binary based on chromosomes because we have DNA that we're actually able to say, yes, these are, are females, at least chromosomally buried with hunting implements. And a good number, there's a, a large uh, burial site where you had a lot of female burials that are buried with those hunting implements. But then you also have some females that didn't have the hunting implements as well as some males without the hunting implements. Um, another really great example comes from our Neanderthal fossil record. Um, and it comes from injury rates among Neanderthals and comparing female injury rates to male injury rates. So for the most part, uh, we believe that the Neanderthal style of hunting was kind of up close and personal with the prey, like spearing kind of hunting. Um, and females and males had the exact same injury patterns. Um, mm -hmm. And so we don't have evidence, at least among Neanderthals, that there was any sexual division of labor, um, uh, you know, for their style of hunting. We do get some uh, division. Um, you, you see more commonly thrower's elbow among males when we get more closer to recent times, whether it's spears or atlatls. Uh, but you you still see thrower's elbow among females too. Uh, but it is not really until agriculture where we start seeing more of a, of a division of labor. But even then, it still takes some time to, to get to the point that we see today. At least what we assume was today. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the last question we are taking from our uh, viewers is from Lloyd. Do you have any thoughts on how better to interpret archaeological findings mm -hmm. without our current cultural biases, like an objective checklist? Yeah, I feel like idea. it's going to be a short checklist. Um, <laughs> I'm sure I could come up with a, you know, a 10 point checklist for you, Lloyd, if I had a little bit more time to think about it. But I'm going to tell you two things. One, you need a diverse research team. You need a research team with a great number of gender representations and cultural representations. That way you don't have one single bias being represented on that research team that is then going to kind of cloud the interpretation of any of the evidence you have. And two, you need to, maybe it's going to be a three checklist, to be aware of your biases going into these interpretations. Make your own checklist of the ways you are thinking about the data ahead of time. And then once you go through your analysis, see like, right, did this bias actually seep into this interpretation? And three, I, I think people need to go into these interpretations with as much objectivity as possible, such as going in with the, the null hypothesis of there is no sexual division of labor. However, uh, a sexual division of labor might be evident if I see A, B, C, and D in the evidence. Uh, if I actually have the data to show this, then we can say there's sexual division of labor. But if you're not seeing the evidence for that, don't just say like, oh, you know, we didn't see any, you know, biological markers of sexual division of labor, but hey, it was probably likely, which is kind of what we see a lot in interpretations, that they just go to this default of a deep sexual division of labor, rather than letting the data drive the story, they're letting the story kind of paint the data. Our last question is, do you have any advice for those who are interested in pursuing a career in science? Talk to scientists. We love talking about our work probably more than you want to hear. Um, if you didn't get from, you know, this interaction here with me, I love talking about my work and I get really excited about it. Um, talk to people, uh, get involved, get involved with local museums. There are tons and tons and tons of like local archeological sites and societies that bring on volunteers if you wanna do digs. Um, same thing with ecology work. People are always looking for help for collecting specimens here and there and they'll train you up to do it. So reach out. We love talking about what we do and we love sharing what we do. And, you know, and if somebody says no, 
move on to the next person. You're in no worse shape than if you hadn't asked to begin with. So keep asking um, and get yourself involved in kind of local community levels of science uh, or local university or college levels of science because there are places for you. And we actually can be a warm and welcoming community. And we love bringing people up and mentoring as best we can. Well, thank you all so much for your questions. And thank you so much, Kara. This was a absolutely wonderful episode. Thank you. And thank you all again for all the amazing work that you have done. And a huge thank you to Eleanor and to Megan for the behind the scenes work that everyone sees, but doesn't know they're the ones behind the scenes <laughs> doing it. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, thank you. So Next time on Lunch Break Science, we meet primatologist Elaine Guevara and learn about lemur sensory ecology, aging, and life histories. We hope to see all of you there, and uh, it's going to be another wonderful episode. So thank you all for taking a break from your day and feeding your brain with the Leaky Foundation. Until next time, stay hungry for knowledge. Lunch Break Science is brought to you by the Leaky Foundation and made possible by the generous support of the Ann and Gordon Getty Foundation, Camilla and George Smith, and the Joan and Arnold Travis Education Fund, as well as viewers like you. Show your support of Lunch Break Science by subscribing to our channel, clicking on notifications, and giving us a thumbs up, or making a donation to help us create new content. Still craving science and can't wait for the next episode? You can feast on the Leaky Foundation's content library with past episodes, lectures, our podcast origin stories, and more. Thank you all for tuning in and see you next time.